This talk is about high precision estimation of random walks in small space. This is joint work between Amir Ahmadinejad, John Kellner, Jack Murtaugh, John Peebles, that's me, Aaron Sidford, and Salil Vatan. I'm going to start by talking about the RL versus L problem, which is a problem about what can be computed in a small amount of space. When talking about low space computation, we have to be a little bit careful in specifying the model because if we count the size of the input to the algorithm towards its space usage or the size of its output, then often the space usage of the algorithm will just be the max of those two things, the max of the size of the input or the output. And the way that we get around this, and it's the convention in this field, is to simply define this problem away. So we consider a model in which we have a read-only input x. The algorithm is allowed to read from this input and has access to s bits of read-write memory. That read-write memory is the only thing that we're counting as the algorithm's actual space usage, and then it gets to write to a write-only output the answer to uh, whatever problem it's trying to compute. What is the RL versus L problem? RL is the set of things that you can compute in logarithmic space when you have access to randomness and are allowed one-sided error. L is the set of things that you can compute in logarithmic space when you're not allowed any randomness. And a long-standing goal in complexity theory is to prove that these two things are equal up to constant factors. In other words, to prove that anything you can compute when you have access to randomness in logarithmic space, you can also compute still in logarithmic space, even if you don't have access to randomness. And a formally easier problem, which morally may be similar in difficulty, is to, instead of proving that RL and L are equal up to constant factors, proving that they're equal up to something slightly larger than constant. So think like polylog logarithmic factors. When you take an algorithm and turn it from a randomized algorithm to a deterministic algorithm, like you would do in this case of proving RL equals L, this is called derandomization. One of the classical approaches to derandomization, including trying to prove RL equals L, is via something called a pseudorandom generator. A pseudorandom generator is an algorithm that takes as input a truly random seed, which is short, and stretches it out to a much longer random number, which is not quite as random as its input, but hopefully still random enough that if you use it as the randomness that an algorithm has access to, a randomized algorithm, in order to make its decisions, then that algorithm will hopefully still work with roughly the same success probability as before. The way that you use a pseudorandom generator in order to try to de-randomize an algorithm is as follows. So you have your randomized algorithm. It takes as input its actual input, as well as some random bits that it uses to make its decisions. And instead of giving it random bits, we give it pseudorandom bits from a pseudorandom generator. And then we have the algorithm produce its output. And so if we do this, uh, and the pseudorandom generator is good, meaning that it doesn't hurt the success probability of the algorithm, then you know we still have a randomized algorithm with a good success probability that uses now a smaller number of random bits, so it's still a randomized algorithm. And then we can convert it to a fully deterministic algorithm by, instead of giving it a truly random seed, because the seed is so short, we can just try every possible seed, and eventually we'll find one that makes the algorithm work. Because remember, we're working with algorithms that have one-sided error, so this is something we can actually do. And if we do that, then now there's no randomness at all, so we have a deterministic algorithm. The approach of trying to use pseudorandom generators to solve RL versus L, although it hasn't completely solved the problem, it has made some notable progress. One example is Nissan's pseudorandom generator, which takes as input a seed of length log squared n, and then outputs a pseudorandom number that's n bits long. And if you use this in the construction from the previous slide to try to turn a randomized algorithm into a deterministic one, then you'll go from log n space to log squared n space, which is a little bit worse than what we want, but still better than nothing. And then this was further improved by Saxon Joe, who uh, their construction is not itself a pseudo-random generator that can be directly plugged into the construction. Instead, it sort of opens up uh, Nissan's generator and uses it to show that anything you can do in log n space with randomness, you can do in log to the three halves in space deterministically. Pseudorandom number generators are nice because first, they're oblivious to their input, meaning that you can de-randomize an algorithm in an entirely black box fashion without knowing what inputs the algorithm will be used on ahead of time. And second, you can use them not just in this particular model we're talking about today, but other related models, like for example, streaming algorithms. And finally, 
you can use pseudorandom number generation not just to estimate the probability that it, an a randomized algorithm outputs yes or no, but also to estimate the probabilities of intermediate states in the algorithm at every time step. So what is the probability you know, that after t steps, the algorithm will be in state j? Cons of pseudorandom number generators are mainly that we just don't know how to get them with good enough parameters, or even whether they exist with good enough parameters. And if you're trying to get a seed length of about log n, we only know that in certain special cases. So for example, uh, if you are trying to use a pseudorandom number generator that works for branching programs of width less than or equal to three, I'm not going to define what those are, or uh, what are called regular branching programs of width uh, constant, also not going to define that. Another approach to trying to prove RL equals L is via the use of graph algorithms. The way this approach works is it exploits the fact that a randomized algorithm can be equivalently viewed as a random walk on a corresponding directed graph, where this directed graph is obtained by, for every state that the randomized algorithm can take, making a node in the directed graph, and for every transition between states in the algorithm, sticking an edge between the corresponding nodes in the directed graph. And using this equivalence, running the randomized algorithm is equivalent to just performing a random walk on this directed graph. And any question you could ask about the randomized algorithm, like whether or not it outputs some answer with some probability, you can ask by asking the corresponding question on the directed graph. And because of this, this naturally says that if you want to de-randomize an algorithm, it suffices to be able to deterministically answer questions about random walks on directed graphs. And there's been some prior work on this. So in 2005, Rheingold showed that ST connectivity, if you want to compute whether a vertex T is reachable from a vertex S, you can compute that in deterministic logarithmic space in undirected graphs. A year later, Rheingold, Trevisan, and Vaden showed that even if you have an Eulerian directed graph, you can still compute ST connectivity in log space deterministically. And they also showed in that same paper that if we have an arbitrary graph, except for the fact that we require its mixing time to be polynomial, and we can solve ST connectivity in all such graphs, then we can solve any randomized log space problem in deterministic log space, as long as the algorithm that we're using to do it runs in deterministic log space. Some pros of this approach are that it gives de-randomization for pretty natural problems about random walks. However, one of the big cons of this approach, at least up until our work, was that it could only estimate the long-term behavior of random walks. So remember we said that pseudorandom number generators could estimate the probability that you're in a particular state at every point in, in the algorithm, or equivalently every point in the random walk if you take a random walk's viewpoint. Whereas these graph algorithms would really only tell you whether or not you know the algorithm outputs accept or reject uh, with some probability. In fact, not even telling you the probability, just really telling you whether it can output accept or reject, and then using the fact that you have one side error to say that, okay, just if it can output accept, that must mean that the answer to this problem is true. An important aspect of our work is that it essentially eliminates this con. Specifically, we give deterministic approximately log space algorithms for a variety of natural problems, including finding random walk probabilities for finite length random walks, so this is the same kind of thing, for example, that you could do with pseudorandom number generators, but you couldn't really do with existing graph algorithmic approaches to de-randomization. Uh, we can compute hitting times, we can compute commute times, escape probabilities, so all the sort of natural random walk quantities you would think to compute. And we can do this for random walks in undirected graphs, but also um, Eulerian directed graphs as well, but not arbitrary directed graphs. As a reminder of how all these types of graphs relate to each other, you have the broad class of directed graphs, which includes within it the set of undirected graphs, which are just directed graphs where the number of edges in each direction is the same. You have regular graphs, which are directed graphs where the in degree and out degree of each vertex is the same and is equal to some fixed number d, which is fixed for that graph. And then finally, you have Eulerian graphs, which generalize both regular and undirected graphs, which are directed graphs where the in degree of every vertex is equal to the out degree, but it's allowed to differ for every node instead of being the same like it is in regular graphs. Returning to our work, we've talked a bit about what we did, but I now want to talk about the methods that we used to do it. Essentially, what we did was we combined ideas from the literature on space-bounded de-randomization. That's what we've been talking about for this 
past couple of slides with ideas from the literature on nearly linear time Laplacian solvers in directed graphs, which historically have not been used for low space applications. And in order to explain what exactly this line of work is that we were using related to directed Laplacians, it's helpful to explain uh, what they are and how you solve them. So a directed Laplacian of a graph is a matrix corresponding to the graph. And it's just simply defined as the identity matrix minus the walk matrix of the graph. So you don't need to actually look at this carefully, but just as an example, if you have a graph G that's a directed graph, its Laplacian matrix L would be this matrix. The reason we care about these Laplacian matrices is that being able to perform linear algebraic operations on them is a very useful algorithmic tool to have. In particular, if we could solve Laplacian linear systems, that is, linear systems where the matrix is a Laplacian matrix in deterministic logarithmic space, this would immediately imply that RL equals L very easily. And note that in this low space setting, solving a Laplacian linear system is actually just equivalent to computing the pseudo inverse of the Laplacian matrix. This is not true in the low time setting, and speaking of the low time setting, solvers for Laplacian linear systems have been a fundamental primitive in algorithmic graph theory, and they've been used for everything from graph sparsification to faster algorithms for max flow and sampling random spanning trees. And the thing that enabled these speedups were nearly linear time randomized algorithms for solving Laplacian linear systems, in particular for solving them in undirected graphs, which is work of Spielman and Tang in 2004. But more recently, we've been able to generalize this to solve it not just in undirected graphs, but to solve Laplacian systems in Eulerian directed graphs. That was work of Cohen, Kellner, myself, Peng, Rao, Sidford, and Vladu, and Cohen, Kellner, King, myself, Peng, Rao, and Sidford. And more generally, arbitrary directed graphs that have polynomial mixing time. This is work of Cohen, Kellner, myself, Peng, Sidford, and Vladu. And sort of analogously to this work, generalizing the classes of graphs for which we can solve Laplacian linear systems in low time, there's been a line of work for solving Laplacian linear systems in low deterministic space. Uh, specifically in uh, 2017, Murtaugh, Reingold, Sidford, and Vatan showed that you could solve Laplacian linear systems in nearly logarithmic space deterministically. And what this work does is generalizes this to Eulerian directed graphs, sort of giving an analog of that low time result that was previously known. And then you might ask, all right, well, can you then, you know, also extend this to polynomial time mixing directed graphs with no requirement of being Eulerian, as was done in the low time case, and that's still open. The reduction that's used doesn't quite carry over in the low space setting. But if you could do this, you would immediately have RL equals L by that result from that paper we discussed a few slides ago. Applications of being able to solve Laplacian linear systems in a particular class of graphs in nearly logarithmic space include solving a variety of random walk related problems in nearly logarithmic space as well. So things like commute times, hitting times, escape probabilities, estimating mixing times, and whatever class of graphs you can solve Laplacian linear systems in low space in. But the application that we're going to talk about today, which is sort of a actually a white box application of our work, is deterministic algorithms for something called uh, WRP, which stands for estimating random walk probabilities. So what this problem is, is you're given a random walk matrix W, a natural number k and an epsilon greater than zero, and you want to compute w to the k, so the kth power of w, to entry-wise error plus or minus epsilon additive. And what we show in our paper is that in space log n k times some polylog stuff, you can compute w to the k for undirected graphs and Eulerian directed graphs. And so here, when we say Eulerian directed graphs, what we mean is that the original graph that the walk matrix W came from, you have it, and it's Eulerian, or undirected. And the approach we use combines ideas from time-efficient randomized Laplacian solvers and from Reingold's theorem, as well as successor works. The rest of this talk is devoted to explaining how we can estimate random walk probabilities to high precision in nearly logarithmic space. 
we're going to go in reverse order starting from the end and working back to the beginning. So we're going to start with talking about how we can do this high precision estimation of w to the k for all k given a high precision estimate of the pseudo inverse of a Laplacian matrix. This is a new reduction in our paper. Then we're going to explain how we get that high precision estimate of the pseudo inverse of the Laplacian from a low precision approximation of it. This uses preconditioned Richardson iteration. Then we're going to explain how we can get that low precision approximation from a low precision approximation of w to the k. Finally, we're going to explain how to get the low precision approximation of w to the k from nothing using the derandomized square of graphs. And we're going to start with the final step. Recall that we want to, given a walk matrix W, compute W to the K to within plus or minus epsilon for all K. And because it's for all K, we can put K minus 1 in the exponent as we've done here, and that's completely equivalent, and we'll see it's more convenient for us to do that. So we're given a graph with walk matrix W, and here's the reduction. For any directed graph, there is a natural way of converting it to a bipartite graph by making two copies of the vertex set and linking up the vertices from the left to the right according to edges in the graph. So if we do that, we get this graph, and then we can just stick a bunch of copies of this graph back to back. We call this the path-lifted graph, and it can be described algebraically as follows. So you take the adjacency matrix of the directed path, and then wherever you see a 1, instead of sticking a 1 there, you stick a W there. And note that you know anytime we have a matrix where we replace or multiply the numbers in the matrix by a matrix to form a block matrix, that operation is a tensoring operation. And so we can write this path lifted graph as the adjacency matrix of the path of length k, that's p sub k, tensored with the walk matrix w. Now consider the pseudo inverse of this path lifted graph. This is a pretty regular mathematical object, and so as one might expect, one can explicitly derive a closed form solution for what the pseudo inverse looks like. And what you get when you do that is this matrix. So this is a matrix that has the identity matrix on the diagonal, it's a block matrix. It has w under the diagonal, w squared under that, and so on and so forth, all the way down to w to the k minus 1 in the bottom left corner. And so if we have the inverse of this path lifted graph, we can just read off w to the k minus 1. And in particular, if we know this inverse to high precision, then we know w to the k minus 1 to high precision. This is a legitimate reduction from estimating random walk probabilities to computing the pseudo inverse of a Laplacian matrix. But we can't quite use it as is in our case because it does not preserve Eulerianness. And our algorithm for computing the pseudo inverse of Laplacian matrices only works on Eulerian graphs. But thankfully, there's a relatively simple fix for this, which is to add an extra vertex, which connects the first and last layer, and this will make the graph Eulerian. So we add a vertex V here, connect the last layer to it, and then connect V to the first layer. And now the graph is Eulerian, so we can use our Eulerian Laplacian solver on it. And we're going to call this graph W hat. And what is known is that if you want to compute the probability of a transition, say from vertex s to vertex t, then we can look at vertex s in the first layer and vertex t in the last layer and compute the escape probabilities of it using a reduction from CKP19. And this will give us the escape or the um, transition probability that we want. The second to last step in our algorithm is to obtain a high precision estimate of L pseudo inverse from a low precision estimate of it. And we use preconditioned Richardson iteration to do that. Due to time, we're not going to go into the details, however. The next reduction is to obtain a low precision approximation of L pseudo inverse from a low precision approximation of W to the K for each K. Due to time, we can't go into this in detail, but the way it basically works is it takes a solver that works in the low time setting and replaces some subroutines with low space subroutines while running the solver instead of on just the graph itself, which doesn't work, at least not obviously, in the low space setting. We have to run it on sort of a specially structured graph that is obtained by tensoring W with a cycle. So you can think of it sort of like that path-lifted graph we showed a few slides ago, but instead of a path, it's a cycle. 
In particular, the main subroutine we need in order to use the algorithm in the reduction we were just talking about is one that obtains a low precision spectral approximation to w to the k for all k and does it in nearly logarithmic space. The way we do this is we use the derandomized square algorithm for graphs of Rheingold and Vadhen. Now, even though we're using this existing algorithm, we have to do a different analysis than has previously been done. In particular, we introduced this notion called unit circle approximation, which allows us to show that powering doesn't actually mess up the approximation. Unit circle approximation is a notion of approximation for Laplacian matrices, and compared to other such notions that have been previously studied, it has the key feature that if we have a walk matrix W tilde and W, and their Laplacian matrices approximate each other, then if we raise W tilde and W to some kth power, their Laplacian matrices still approximate each other, and moreover this holds with no change in the approximation quality. Prior notions of approximation generally would lose something in the approximation quality if you did this. I'm going to give some intuition now, and in order to do that, instead of talking about a Laplacian matrix i minus w, I want to talk about the number 1 minus w. So we're just going to write 1 minus w, and it's just a positive number that... Multiplicative approximation for positive numbers, remember, is just defined as, we say, a multiplicatively approximates b within a factor of 1 plus or minus epsilon if the ratio of a and b is between 1 plus epsilon and 1 minus epsilon. And then we want to ask, does this have the key feature that we said above if we stick in 1 minus w and 1 minus w tilde in place of a and b. So we suppose that 1 minus w tilde multiplicatively approximates 1 minus w within a factor of 1 plus or minus epsilon. Remember, these are just numbers. And then we want to ask, how well does 1 minus w tilde squared approximate 1 minus w squared? And the answer, if you work this out, is that it's within a 1 plus or minus 2 epsilon factor. So we are losing something in the approximation quality, and in fact it's pretty big. Because in more general settings, when we raise w to the kth power, we can lose a factor of k, not just 2. And so we're going to completely wipe out our approximation guarantee uh, if we try to use these existing notions of approximation, which are analogous to multiplicative approximation for positive numbers in the scalar case. That takes us to unit circle approximation. So for positive numbers, our notion of unit circle approximation just says that we require not just that 1 minus w tilde and 1 minus w approximate each other, but that we have approximation for 1 minus z w tilde and 1 minus z w for a positive 1 and negative 1 for both those values of z. And this generalizes to not just positive numbers like we've been talking about here, but actually to complex numbers in non-symmetric matrices. And in that case, we require that the approximation hold not just for z equals plus or minus 1, but for all roots of unity. And that's where it gets the name unit circle approximation. And if we do this, we do in fact have the key feature that if w tilde and w, their Laplacian matrices, approximate each other, then the powers of w and w tilde, their Laplacian matrices, still approximate each other with no change in the approximation quality. Once again, we don't have time to go into the full details, so we'll end with a recap of our main results. Recall that we want to, given a directed graph G with random walk matrix W, compute W to the K to within entry-wise error plus or minus epsilon. We showed that we can do this in deterministic space, log in k, up to some log logs, for undirected graphs and for Eulerian directed graphs. The approach we used combined ideas from time-efficient randomized Laplacian solvers and from Rheingold's theorem and successor works to that. Other results that we obtained included deterministic nearly log space algorithms for solving Eulerian Laplacians and for commute computing commute times and escape probabilities in Eulerian graphs. There are several natural questions that our work suggests. First, one could ask whether one could extend our work to solve directed Laplacian systems for arbitrary polynomial time mixing directed graphs, which would allow one to solve all BPL problems in deterministic logarithmic space if one could do that. And an indication that maybe this might be possible is that there is actually a reduction from poly general poly and mixing time directed graphs to or Larian Laplacians, which is the case we solve, that runs in nearly linear time. So if instead of making it run in nearly linear time, you made it run in nearly logarithmic space, you'd be done. Another question is whether one can estimate high powers of w to the k in nearly linear time. We do it in nearly linear space. One could try to better understand this notion of unit circle approximation that we use in our analysis. And finally, 
one could try to improve or combine our work with pseudorandom generators for log space, at least for regular graphs or branching programs. That concludes the talk. You can find references for most of the papers at the archive link.